and welcome to the Scotta Chronicast, the podcast which discusses all things relating to medieval Scotland. I'm your host, Dr. Kate Buchanan. This is episode 12, and I am excited to be joined by Dr. Helen Newsom. Welcome to the Scotta Chronicast. Hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining me today. Would you mind telling the listeners a little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah, so uh, my name's Helen Newsom, and I am a historical linguist. And last year, I finished my PhD on the correspondence of the late medieval Scottish queen, Margaret Tudor. And I'm currently finalising um, an edition of her letters, and I write a lot about her language use and um, how she uses letters to engage in um, early modern Anglo-Scots diplomacy. Excellent. I'm super excited for that edition of her letters to come out. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. The people seem to be interested. Oh, yeah, Definitely. I think Amy Hayes was telling me that you were making this collection and I was very excited to hear that. So, Oh, thanks. Look forward it's, to it. It's really strange is that well, as a researcher, you work alone in this isolation and you think, oh, maybe no one will be interested, but apparently, hopefully it, it will be of use to people. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think there's there's going to be a lot of interest in it. So that's, that's exciting that you're, you're doing that. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, before we get too much further into discussing that, how did you start your, your kind of journey to becoming historical linguist? And how did, how did you get to medieval Scotland along that road? Completely by chance, as I think <laughs> happens with everyone. Um, yeah. So I, I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Sheffield in English um, language and literature. And I was interested in like early modern literature, kind of civil war writing. Mm -hmm. And then I went traveling for six months, as you do when you're young and bright and bushy tailed and then I thought I'd, I'd quite maybe quite like to do an MA because I was always quite interested um so I came back to Sheffield to do an MA in English language and linguistics and I thought right I'm going to specialize in the um interrelationship between English language and literature I'm going to look at English civil war poetry and maybe some royal writing ironically there seems to be little connections that sort of uh, piece together um as oh, I go cool. Yeah, I know. There's little hints along the way. Um, but uh, they weren't actually running any of the English literature modules that year because there weren't enough keen students. Um, oh. So, yeah. Um, so I had to put together um, my supervisor for my PhD, actually, was a supervisor um, of the MA course. And he suggested that I take a module on paleography. Um, so oh. historic handwriting. Yes. Oh. Love oh bibliography. Honestly, it was one of those classes where it it was just felt like coming home. It was like a doctor water to it. It just absolutely yes. loved it. And then in one of our classes, uh, Dr. Graham Williams at University of Sheffield brought in this manuscript and it was one of Margaret Tudor's letters. Oh, cool. And so we like transcribed it and I just thought it was quite interesting. And then we were talking about um, what I was going to do for my MA dissertation. And I said, oh, I'm really interested in like historic manuscripts and I'd like to do some kind of actual paleography kind of an archival mm -hmm. uh, inquiry for my uh, dissertation. So he suggested that I did a dissertation on, on Margaret and on um, her sister, Mary Tudor. She's the one who married the King of France um, and later right. Charles Brandon. So it was literally just because one of the modules that I wanted to take uh, didn't run that I took paleography and then <laughs> well discovered historic handwriting and then and, and Scotland just by chance through Margaret yeah. she, she just kind of took over my life really and then <laughs> when I did my MA dissertation I was, just, I was just obsessed absolutely obsessed and um and I was like right I've got to do a PhD on her no one's really ever looked at Margaret's correspondence before she's right. a completely lost figure like this she's often the occasional footnote in um like Tudor histories and things like that but really especially right. in English history she really doesn't get kind of much celebration and, and so began my strange obsession and love affair with Margaret Tudor 
<laughs> well, so that's, yeah that's awesome thanks it's a bit random to tell it out loud i guess no i i love those that's how it works anyway that's how it worked for me anyway you you're on this one track and you just accidentally go do this one thing and then you find something that you're just absolutely in love with forever completely it was i think it's just the manuscripts that was what did it it was the handwriting the manuscripts and and the yeah. fact that it was just so undiscovered it was just like this untapped jewel and i just thought i've got to do this um, yeah, and, and and as I was finding the letters and transcribing them, it became more and more of a monster. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, paleography is is one of my. I love I love looking at old manuscripts <laughs> and figuring out what they actually say. I haven't actually looked at any recently, which is sad. But yeah, I just I loved that part of it and like deciphering the handwriting and stuff. You just feel like such a like a code breaker. Yeah, you know? it's like you're a detective. Yeah, the time completely just it it just runs by me when I'm doing paleography and and when you get to handle manuscripts for the first time, it's just it's still so such an excited experience when I go into the archive and I open a volume of like bound letters like yeah the smell and the tactile and just like seeing the size of the paper and the handwriting and just where they've changed ink and how they've yep. sealed like correspondence just it's such a delight yeah. still yeah it's it's pretty wonderful and it's like that extra kind of I don't know, connection to the people of the past is, is like they they actually held this and they wrote this with their hand. Completely. It's like you're sat in their in their shoes, isn't it? You can, I just yeah. imagine them like sitting at a desk with their writing like table out and then physically preparing the ink and, and, and sharpening it and just like the labor of um, mm -hmm. creating this correspondence. I really you really feel that when you're like engaged with the manuscript it's completely fascinating I think it's something we just people just don't appreciate now and, and in my classes when I'm teaching I like I often make reconstructions of correspondence so I seal it as it was originally mm -hmm. sealed and when you explain the writing process people are just overwhelmed they're like oh my god like wow it's not it wasn't like you know you just popped your email up and like tapped a quick right. letter no it's just so incredibly uh such a laborious activity but it really like you say yeah. you really kind of get a sense of who that person was and and like standing in their footsteps mm -hmm. and and hopefully I sort of secretly think I'm like maybe my DNA is touching their DNA <laughs> which I know yes. is weird and then oh if you find like a hair in a volume like oh is that original yeah <laughs> it's probably yeah. not it's probably mine <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> yeah no I and I love like I don't know you make these like little judgments about them it's like oh as far as their ink choice and like <laughs> when they're you know obviously using you know a certain type of pen versus another or um it's just you can yeah you can just kind of get that much more personal just like now if you sit down and write anything by hand which i know is not something that people generally do much anymore yeah you you can tell like oh this person is i don't know stressed out you can tell that or yeah and what they're doing like there's a few of margaret's letters where um so she's quite a prolific writer quite unusually in this period mm -hmm. um, for a late medieval queen she actually has um from what i can find out um, the largest collection of, of correspondence written in her own hand is called holograph correspondence um, of any medieval or early modern queen written in English or Scott. So it's like an overwhelmingly large corpus. It's 111 letters. Oh, wow. Um, it's huge. I mean, it's not as big as, say, like the Elizabeth I corpus, which is like 3,000 right. letters, but she only wrote 97 letters that survive in her own hand today. So kind of in comparison to other medieval and early modern queens, Margaret was like, she spent a lot of time at that writing table. Right. <laughs> and I was just... And, and you can tell, like, in this certain situations where she's ill, where she's used a scribe, and then she's, like, signed the letter mm -hmm. with, like, a little holograph inscription, a postscript. And you can mm -hmm. see, like, her handwriting is just that little bit more shaky than usual. And it really kind of, it's just such a tactile and fascinating kind of glimpse of to what, like you say, what she, how she was feeling or kind of what yeah. was going on at that time. Yeah, that's so, that's so cool. Yeah, so... 
how did these letters survive? Why do we have so much of her stuff? <laughs> yeah, we, well, like for Scottish stuff, we just don't have much that survives. Like it's it's rare to have that much. Yeah, yeah, completely. So um, what's interesting is that so what I've found so far in my um, kind of inquiries and my hunting continues is that there's hardly there's very little of her correspondence that survives in Scottish archives. So we don't really have right. any correspondence to her son or to her husbands or any kind of Scottish nobleman really um and that's probably something to do with maybe the well the nature of a correspondence like kind of uh familial material it's kind of quite ephemeral it's not that kind of particularly important you know if it's a love letter it's you know pop right. it in the bin really <laughs> or sort of thing you know can you send me some horses it's not you know it's not necessarily quite weighty material it's just sort of you know it's like our everyday chit chat right and there's very little in Scottish archives, probably because of that, but also because Scottish archives went through a bit of a, well, royal archives went through a, a bit of a, a, a turbulent past, shall we say, <laughs> uh, for, for a number of different reasons, which I find quite amusing. Mm-hmm. Um, like they were sent to England and then they were returned back to Scotland on two boats um, after the interregnum, and one of the boats mm-hmm. sunk. So in my head, yep. I like to think that some of Margaret's correspondence was on that boat that sunk. Um, yep. So there's hardly uh, anything. But there is, um, there's a lot of Margaret's correspondence in English archives, and that is because through her marriage to James IV of Scotland, Margaret formed kind of a, a she she became a bond between the two realms. And in, right. in queenship studies, this is a really common thing where um, you would marry. Um, well, in, in royal history, you marry kings and, and queens and princes and princesses to each other yeah. to form like diplomatic ties. Um, and Margaret. Margaret and her correspondence really kind of fulfilled this diplomatic function. A lot of Margaret's correspondence right. is um, she really styles herself in the role of mediator. So she kind of tries to negotiate peace between England and Scotland through her own writing. And when things get a little bit tough, they often draw upon um, the leaders of Scotland. When James IV dies, um, John Stuart, Duke of Albany, often right. draws on Margaret to write um, to Henry VIII asking for peace to be uh, organised. So I think that's really why so much of the material is preserved because it serves a really important diplomatic function. Um, right. So most of the material that survives is generally quite, it's not dull, but it's quite dry. So people right. think, you know, people go, oh, well, you know, do you hear things about her love child, like a love child, or do you hear anything about, you know, mm. the romantic relationship she had with James the Fourth? And there's none of that kind of, you know, sort of personal um, reflection and kind of juicy details. It's more kind of, you know, please can we have a peace treaty and let's have a diplomatic right. meeting. <laughs> um, but, that, but that, but, but you know, it's those details that were so kind of important, um, which is why they've uh, preserved all of her correspondence that relates to Anglo-Scottish and um, kind of political and diplomatic affairs because she was, you know, right. it's, a, it's a paper trail and um, she was useful. Yeah, the, the fact that the reason why a lot of it survives is because it wasn't in Scotland. Is- is it? Yeah, it's it's kind of sad. <laughs> Although I'm, yeah. I'm quite, kind of hoping that at some point I'll get to do some, uh, well, some visits to private archives, and I do wonder if there might be some material that's um, uncatalogued, right, undiscovered as of yet. Yeah, yeah, and you know, because she's been so kind of lost to history, I guess to some extent, um, and she's kind of not. A, well, she's not Mary Queen of Scots, is she? So people aren't necessarily no. looking for this material. It's just me that's interested. <laughs> I don't think you're the only one, but yeah, I know what you I'm mean. I'm the only person who wants to actually um, go and look. <laughs> yeah. It's surprising how much stuff is still like in people's attics or basements and stuff right now. Oh, like, Absolutely. Um, and I think, especially like noble family archives, I wonder if there are mm-hmm. just these boxes of historic correspondence that just haven't really been catalogued or investigated in any detail. It's like yeah. I used to, uh, during my MA, I did some uh, work with chats with archives and you look in there, honestly, like they've got a card catalogue system, yeah. which is great, but obviously completely inaccessible to most researchers. Right. So this stuff's there, just it's not, we can't find it on the internet. <laughs> Right, exactly, which is kind of a problem right now, but <laughs> yeah, I, ironically, a little. So I, I live in hope that something I will find more. Yes, 
I'm sure I'm sure they will. I, I will it will be positive with you. There will be something. <laughs> yeah, maybe. There'll be something. I, I did once find um a, a record. It was a like a it was a minute, it was like a transcription of a letter Margaret sent to her they're called what are they call an advocate so it's basically like a lawyer uh-huh. and it was it's been recorded in the court session record so I think it was obviously sent to her lawyer who then presented it in front of kind of the council um for a legal proceeding and I have right. got a transcript of one of those but that's it oh that's cool <laughs> yeah it's kind of fun yeah this guy called Robert Galbraith and I always uh he sounds like yeah. quite an interesting fellow yeah that's cool yeah of course something in the law record <laughs> has to survive somewhere one thing. Anyway, sorry. It just give you a really detailed history of Margaret's archive. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> yeah, so I assume I've, I've seen a little bit of your stuff talking about um, her writing in Scots um, and then writing in English. So yeah. most of what has survived, what is she writing in? So that's kind of an interesting topic, which I'm still to fully get to the bottom of. Um, so Margaret's first surviving letter is written when she arrives at the English court, um, at the Scottish court. It's shortly written after her marriage, I think, sometime in August 1503. Mm-hmm. And two thirds of it are written in the hand of a scribe, and that's an English scribe. And then Margaret right. finishes the letter in her own hand. Um, so she was obviously born and, and raised in the um, English court. So she speaks or she writes with um an English southern southern English linguistic forms um, and right. you can see those in this little postscript that she has in this really early letter it's really it's hideous to read but it's a really <laughs> fascinating letter it's one of the only ones that actually kind of gives some insight into what uh, you know some of her feelings because she writes to Henry the seventh her father and she says you know mm-hmm. I, I, I would that I were with you now um and like wishes him to like be well right it's really lovely um and then we don't have a lot of material for about 10 years. Um, oh. So it's kind of hard to see the extent to which she acquired Scots. Um, and she right. would have done. You expect people to accommodate linguistically when they meet people um, and when they mm-hmm. move to a different place. Um, like if I moved to Scotland, I imagine my accent and my Lexis that I use um, would change a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then um, my PhD supervisor, Dr. Graham Williams, wrote an article looking at Margaret's use of Scots and suggesting that um, at different times in her political life, when she was kind of more uh, affiliated with Scottish um, politics, she would adjust right. her language use to use um, certain Scots features. And then, and and that is true for to some extent in the writing. Um, mm-hmm. But then. In 1515, she flees Scotland and she goes back to the English court and her letters that are written when she's at the English court, we have a few of them that survived. There's about five, I think. Um, And they're all written using English linguistic forms. So she's obviously switching. She's adopted, you know, she's switching back to a more English use um, in those situations. So it's not just kind of a static change, um, as you might perhaps expect. And I've been doing some research as part of my PhD, which is now available online if people are interested in reading it. Um, which uh, and there's um, some correspondence which Margaret she chose like a really sh- sudden stylistic change. So there'll be a letter mm-hmm. sent in um, this one sent in November 1534, and she uses quite a lot of English inflections. So things like "eth," whereas in Scotland you'd use "is." So oh, okay. uh, yeah, so you say like um, "pleaseth." Um, versus pleases so she right. uses the English inflections but then two weeks later there's a massive stylistic shift in her writing and it's still written in her own hand um, mm-hmm. but it features lots of Scottishisms like Scottish inflections Scottish Lexis use um, mm. and a whole handwriting changes so I think that there's some evidence of scribal uh, input in she's perhaps looking at a scribal draft and then transmitting those uh, the, the linguistic um, writing practices of a Scots scribe into her own hand. Mm. So it's kind of quite a complex pattern, if that makes sense. Um, right. <laughs> so basically, 
she will have used Scots to some extent um, and will mm-hmm. have definitely collected, she definitely has collected Scots Lexis. Um, she really likes using Mickle, which I like instead of much. Uh, <laughs> she's using yes. uh, in England. That's, that's one of my favourite ones. But the extent to which she used Scots like consistently versus English mm. forms, I think she was probably some kind of mix in the middle. Um, hopefully at the end, I'll get at the end of my book and after I've done some more research, I'll get to the end of it and go, here's exactly exactly what happens right Um, so sorry that's a very complex way to say margaret uses scott sometimes (laughs) right um (laughs) sorry (laughs) no that's kind of what i expected that she wouldn't use just one or the other um yeah right it's logical like (laughs) yeah and i assume that she would be using kind of using one or the other in order to either match the circumstances she were in or to try to make a political statement um or something, you know, just kind of kind of how we all use language today. It's one of those things where you you're in a more formal situation, you speak more formally, um, exactly. or if you're, you know, having lived abroad, yeah, as far as like the the use of different terms in order to avoid sort of the confusion that might lie behind, oh, like I know what that word means, but that's not the word we would typically use like I've kind of had to to develop that sort of switch and like okay well when when we're in the UK or when we're speaking to people from the UK we we use this set of words yeah um <laughs> in order to not have that sort of confusion or whatever that's think- even though it's a very slight confusion and then yeah. in the US I have to kind of like remind myself okay like this is this is how we say time over here um, and this is, you know, the, these are the list of words that I need to use instead in order to similarly avoid confusion. Yeah, um, I think there must have been some degree of, of that. But Margaret, it's not a real simple shift of she's right to Henry VIII. She, you know, she right. doesn't necessarily switch back to just using English terms. So it's it must absolutely be associated with kind of her identity. And, and she's having to negotiate right. this this Scottish royal identity as well as it her English royal heritage. Um, and I, I wish the patterns were more simple, but I definitely think, it, you know, it, it, it's quite intricate and the evidence of kind of influence from other people, it tells us a lot about the complexities of um, looking at, at royal, well, historical documents and, and those written in the hand of an individual. It's not necessarily a, a clear cut idea of authorship. And, and it shows you that actually composing these um, historical letters was probably a very complex process, which involved multiple different agents and different drafts right. and texts, um, which it which is quite fascinating in itself, even though it doesn't necessarily give us a nice uh, description of whether Margaret's just used Scots or not, or why and when she did. Um, you never right. know, in like two years' time, I might have a really clear answer for you. I hope so. <laughs> I expect not, though. No, I imagine it's it's a more complicated situation than <laughs> yeah. that. She's really interesting, though, because what you do get normally is, obviously, with James VI becoming James I of England, you get the anglicisation of Scots a lot in the early modern period. Um, and she's one like one of the few linguistic examples of someone going from England to Scotland and, and, and Scottishizing her, her language use. So that in itself is kind of quite neat. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, the use of, of Scots in in documents it's always super fascinating for me when when it is chosen like in earlier medieval times you know whether than not they choose latin versus scots um i always find that an interesting yeah. interesting choice um it's very i think it must be very conscious you you're projecting a certain kind of um identity i think if you make a choice to to send something in scots um, yeah Definitely. Yeah, I guess the kind of the other side of that, that she was writing in Scots when she's sending letters down to England is that presumably she would understand that they would be able to understand her letters down there. So there must have been at least some understanding down south. That's something I I am spending more time thinking about. Mm Mm-hmm. 
because you sort of I see language well linguists see language as a, like a continuum so you'd have a continuum of dialects from let's say um, Portsmouth all the way to the islands of Scotland so the language mm-hmm. of people who are in let's say really North Yorkshire Northumberland would have probably been more like that of Scottish writers but you've still got like border wardens and people who live in Northumberland so like Thomas Dacre, who lived on the west coast of um, Northumberland, he was an Anglo-Scots border warden, and he wrote mm-hmm. down to um, obviously wrote to Henry VIII, and, and he uses lots of northern features, which are very much like or the same as Scots features. And there's no kind of commentary on it being unintelligible. Now, whether that's because the English readers or audiences could could code switch and could understand um, these terms, right. or whether uh, maybe it's slightly more complicated than that, and perhaps um, it, it places a lot of responsibility on a messenger um, and the person mm-hmm. delivering that text. Perhaps they performed it out loud or they translated it. I wonder if there was some kind of element of, of, of that going on. Right. Uh, yeah. Other yeah, yeah. other members of court that you know were familiar with the language that could translate that sort of thing. Yeah. Or well, how kind of adept was Henry VIII at understanding Scots? You know, they got a lot of correspondence coming between England and Scotland in this period. So you know, yeah, we would all pick up certain elements um, to be able to understand. Or whether we don't really know, you know, how Scots was James the Fifth's kind of scribal writing versus his holograph writing or something like that you know we don't no one's done that study <laughs> yeah or not i guess aware of. it might benefit the listeners at this point as we haven't actually <laughs> necessarily defined this um can you talk a little bit about like what the the difference is like scots as a language versus english as a language during this time yeah okay. and even in a modern context if you if you want to yeah what's <laughs> oh, that is a big question. Uh, well, Scots I know that we could <laughs> we could do years and years of discussing just yeah. on on so, the ling- linguistic differences. But yeah, just a brief <laughs> sort of definition, maybe the basic differences. So, um, yeah. English and Scots historically come from the same linguistic roots um, of Old English. So, um, there's lots of features of Old English that are preserved in um, in early modern Scots um, that are lost in in early modern English. Uh, mm-hmm. So, then there's quite notable differences in Lexis to some extent. So, um, as I said, mickle versus much. So there, there are some differences there. There's some slight spelling differences, which suggest that there are pronunciation differences. Mm-hmm. So one example is one of my favourite ones. So for um, words such as which or who. Mm-hmm. In England, they spell obviously like WH or maybe VH sometimes um, Mm -hmm. in the early modern period. In Scotland, they're generally written with a QU um, orthography, and and that represents Mm -hmm. um, a sound change between English and Scots. So in English, we'd say which, whereas in Scots, they'd say whilk. Um, and it's got a, a H aspiration in front of it. Um, you still find it in things like in, in, in Scotland today and maybe like in um, American accents sometimes. So you might say like uh-huh. whiskey instead of whiskey. I don't right. know if you can hear that like aspiration. Um, so there'd be some differences like that. And also like in certain kind of word endings, especially like with verbs, they're a little bit different. So um, mm. you might use like F versus S. Um, that's quite a, a common one or a, yeah. a present tense verb oh it's very detailed sorry um so we <laughs> say um, <laughs> making they say make and a n d um so the the linguistic mm-hmm. differences are kind of multi-layered but there was lots of intelligibility between the two there's like lots of a lot of similarities because they came come from the same linguistic root so you know mm-hmm. i mean i can understand them there's a there's certain words i have to look up um yeah but a lot of it you can kind of work out quite well yeah yeah. Does that answer your question? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a good good summary of kind of what the, the difference the is main differences. there. Um, I like the example of the, the Q for the W words, because that was always <laughs> one that I was fascinated by. It's like, whoa, how do you say this? How do you say it? Yeah, no, it's not said like quilk. You, it, it, it's right. The, the, where you've got like the, the writing, it's called orthography, um, is really not necessarily representing what we think it would sound like in the present day, you know, they don't say quirk. Right. It's, uh, it's like a silent yeah. Q, a H. 
Yeah, I really kind of wish um, it was a little bit more obvious. It's interesting. Um, there's a letter by Mary, Queen of Scots, and she writes in Scots um, in this letter. And it's quite unusual mm-hmm. for her. She often writes in French. And she uh, she writes um, a WH term, but it's influenced by Scots pronunciation. But because she's mm-hmm. not necessarily been tutored as well in Scots writing, she writes it, um, I think it's HW. Um, so she's representing oh. that pronunciation as she hears it rather than following like, the Scottish writing practices. It is really cool, actually. I only noticed that one recently. Oh, that's fascinating yeah yeah cue you all those freaks people out when they first see scots stop yeah i <laughs> yes i remember those days what is, that like, strange what is going on <laughs> what do i, I do like, with this how do i translate that yeah yeah hopefully that wasn't too uh too formal in terms of her definition as scots linguists are probably gonna like tell me off for butchering <laughs> how you describe <laughs> the linguistic differences between english and scots but oh well <laughs> No, it was a good, those were good examples. We didn't have time to go into like the very technical differences. People um, can Google this. There are books. Yes. There's a, um, Jeremy Smith wrote a book called Older Scots, a Linguistic Reader. So if people are interested in great detail, they can look it up. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. No, I just, I realize that there's a a portion of listeners that haven't, you know, actually studied medieval Scotland um, that might appreciate understanding that Scots language is a unique. Well, it's a unique and distinct language um, in in that time, even though some people might argue it's a dialect versus a language. It absolutely was regarded by the Scots people as their national language. And it was distinct from English. um, And it was inherently, it it was really important. And when you're writing in Scots, you know, it's a massive reflection of, you know, Scottish royal identity and, and national identity. You've got people like William Dunbar writing Scots poetry. It's a real celebration of, of Scots linguistic and, and national identity. So, yeah, that, that distinction is important, especially in that period. Yeah. And it is today, actually. I think there's a massive resurgence in thinking about Scots words um, and yeah. lexis being used. There's so much. It's quite popular on Twitter. It keeps popping up in my head. Yeah timeline is quite fascinating yeah no there is a a good resurgence of it it's one thing I struggle is when you were maybe reading some of Margaret's correspondence out loud I am not sufficiently uh good at a Scottish pronunciation it's Mm. it's a bit of a dilemma yeah how do I read this out (laughs) yeah and that's you know a lot of how we got through our paleography class was the uh, our instructor was my when I was in Scotland, the paleographer instructor for me was um, Alistair Ross. Um, and he would oh, always yeah. say, like, just read it out loud. And then um, <laughs> part of me <laughs> thinks it was for his own amusement. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but it honestly, it did help, you know, not only in like trying to identify what the, the characters were, but also to like understand like what the, the language was that was being I, used. I still, I still do it when I'm in an archive. You'll hear me like reading like this out loud. <laughs> it's, it's, really, it's really helpful sometimes. There's a really weird word that occurred in one of Margaret's letters. It's, if, it says congafethment, which is a ridiculous... Right. I mean, I've never heard of this word before. And saying it out loud meant that I could kind of work out what elements of it were to finally translate it roughly. Um, right. It means dower lands, basically, is a, oh. a very loose translation. Um, but yes, yeah, reading things out loud and breaking them up is very helpful. Yes, yeah, it is. It's very helpful. Um, okay, just as one quick kind of silly question, what yeah. is your favorite time period as far as like paleography? What do you? What is your favorite oh. <laughs> one to read? And uh, what is the one that you've? as your least favorite that you maybe I don't know that you maybe find most challenging it maybe could go for either your favorite or your least favorite depending on how you In view a challenge paleography wow I thought you were going to ask me about Margaret's favorite letter my favorite Margaret letters and that's oh, well, well, that, that'll oh, be the yeah. next question okay oh my favorite is, oh wow oh that's a good one um, I, do you know what? I think it's kind of going to be like two in one. My favourite and least favourite to work with <laughs> is um, it's generally Middle English because right. 
Um, because English starts to resurge as a national language um, in the vernacular, you start to get people writing in the vernacular um, for the first time in a few hundred years. Um, and spelling mm. goes absolutely wild, <laughs> wild. It's, yeah. it's, it's phenomenal, um, which I particularly enjoy because you get the most ludicrous spellings, uh, which, you know, that I water it and how ridiculous they are. I think it's something like there's like, there's like a hundred variants of the word through or something like that. It's probably <laughs> more than that. It's ridiculous. Um, but that that in itself is such a frustration because you're like, what is this? So I think probably yeah. Middle English is my yeah. sort of favourite and, and most challenging sort of uh, paleographical like period to work with. Yeah. And do you know what? No, my, fa- my worst paleographical period it's 18th century the handwriting is oh. hideous it's like <laughs> that's, that's I, so true i can't i can't read any of it um, i'm like well, at least with the early modern period, the secretary hand, it's relatively kind of well formed. But when I mean, right. you start to move on to italic in the 18th century, no, it's just just scribbles. Yeah, that's yeah. it. 18th century hideous. Yeah, things get too tiny and too <laughs> mushed together. Yeah, absolutely yeah. incomprehensible. <laughs> So well done to anybody who actually can read that stuff. Oh, I'll like, take my hat <laughs> off to you. Absolutely. Phenomenal. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go for that question of what is your favorite letter from Margaret? Oh, I've got a couple, but probably my absolute favorite is it's such an interesting letter. So it's a letter that Margaret sent to one of her messengers, who's a gentleman called Patrick Sinclair. And Patrick Sinclair appears to have um, he goes to the English court a lot to be like Margaret's messenger and does a lot of diplomatic activities and he later goes on to become a messenger of James V when he falls out with Margaret's third husband um, Henry Stewart, mm-hmm. the Lord of Methan um, mm-hmm. and so Margaret writes to him and it's a, it's a bit of a secret letter. Um, so she says, don't tell anyone about this um, because if they find out, it'll be like basically a treasonable offence, like they'll kill me. <laughs> and she asks him to do a bit of spying for her and Ooh. to, I know, right? And um, to find out um, this guy uh, is called Adam Dondas, who's... Um, carrying around a document that's been sealed by the French King seal or from what I can decipher in this letter um, and what's mm. really interesting is that she doesn't sign it so it's written in her own hand but she concludes it with the phrase yours ye vate so it means yours you know um, mm-hmm. and doesn't sign it so it's just this like absolute magic letter it's like sort of a <laughs> secret letter um to this really cool servant who's going on some kind of covert spy mission um but- so that's my favourite. Yeah, yeah. It's really cool. This is all I didn't want to leave the incriminating evidence of her signature. <laughs> It, but it's written in my own hand. I've got an article under review that like talks about this letter in, in great detail. So uh, hopefully oh, people cool. will be able to know a bit more about it soon. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, that's my favorite one. And Patrick, I've got a very soft spot for Patrick Sinclair. Um, and it's interesting because that letter, you don't get much correspondence from Margaret to um, kind of people below the nobility or royalty. Um, mm-hmm. And that's one of the few examples which I really like it gives you a bit of an insight into kind of the relationship she shared with people in her employment and and how it must have been such a kind of a close and really trustworthy relationship so I like the fact you've got a little bit more kind of uh, social diversity um in that letter so yes Rob yes that is that's awesome oh cool I look forward to the article that's Oh, that'll that'll be fun. That's It'll cool. It'll be in the edition. There'll be a lot of description about that one. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about Margaret Tudor and the Scots language and paleography, all the all the fun stuff. Thanks for indulging me. It's been fascinating to hear about it, and I love I love talking about paleography. So oh, and language. Literally, everyone should be paleographers. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. It's been so fun. The Scotta Chronicast is just one of many things relating to medieval history on Medievalists.net. If you like what you see and what you hear, consider being a patron on patreon.com slash medievalists. Thank you for joining us on the Scotta Chronicast. Please rate and review wherever you get your podcasts, and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also follow our account on Twitter at Scotta Chronicast. Our music 
is Ex to Lux Oratur by Gaita. Thanks for listening. <laughs>